May all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing your song for joy. Spread your protection over them, for surely, O Lord, us whom you love, hear the good news. We are forgiven.
this morning is Amazing Grace, number 280.
call and response that it goes, God is good all the time. We need to say all the time, God is good. Let's say, God is good all the time. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. That's right. So um, those bad days can teach us good lessons. They can teach us how to be patient. They can teach us to have empathy when other people are having bad days. We need to remember, I know what it feels like to have one of those days. So I'm going to be extra nice to this person because they're crappy today. So we can learn how to do that. Um, but so bad days happen. They just do. Just like rainy days happen sometimes and sometimes the sun shines. But one thing I want you to always remember is that God is good. Dear God, Dear God, thank you for loving us, thank you for loving us. and staying with us, staying with us. even when things are hard. Before we get into our scripture, let us have a prayer for illumination. Guide us, O oh God, by your word and spirit, that in your life you may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So we are in Psalm 50, and we're going to be in Psalm 50 for four weeks total. It will be broke up um, a little bit. But uh, hopefully by the end of this, you will uh, have an understanding of this sermon. And this is for the stewardship series that I'm doing. Uh, Psalm 50 is about worship. And it says, The Mighty One, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from, right, from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets. From Zion, perfect in beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and will not be silent. A fire devours before him, and around him a tempest rages. He summons the heavens above and the earth, that he may judge his people. Gather to me my consecrated ones, who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heavens proclaim his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, and I will testify against you. I, God, am God, your God. I do not rebuke you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings, which are ever before me. I have no need of a bull from your stall or of a goat from your pens. For every animal in the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the creatures of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all that is in it. Do I eat the flesh of the bulls or drink the blood of goats? Sacrifice thanks, uh, thank offerings to God. Fulfill your vows to the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will honor me. But to the wicked, God says, what right have you to recite my laws or take my covenant on your lips? You hate my instruction and cast my words behind you. When you see a thief, you join with him. You throw your, in your lot with adulterers. You use your mouth for evil and harness your tongue for deceit. You speak continually against your brother and slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I have kept silent. You thought I was like you altogether. But I will rebuke you and accuse you to your face. Consider this, you who forget God. None will rescue you. He who sacrifices thank offerings, honor me and prepares the way so that I may show him the salvation of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So one of my favorite things to do is to go to musicals or plays. 
the Salina Theater puts on great shows considering what a small play community it is really in the scheme of things. But it wasn't until my brother got a job working backstage, actually he works back in the rafters, I'm not sure what his job is called, but he walks up there and makes sure the lights shine and things get dropped like they're supposed to. And he would send me videos of him working back there. And I got this first-hand glimpse of how much work goes into it because from up there you can see down behind the stage and the front stage. And I knew, of course, there's a lot of backstage work, but when he began, or I knew, of course, there was a lot of backstage work, but when I got those, I really saw that a lot goes into theater production, and most of it is backstage where we don't see it. We get so wrapped up in the story and the drama of the play itself that we don't think about everything that makes a performance what it is. Lights, backdrops, costume changes. We focus on what's happening in the front stage, which we're supposed to do. The performance of the actors as they are playing out the story of the play itself. What we don't see behind the stage, behind the curtain, behind the veil, is what we never see is that there is drama that goes on back there as well. If we saw behind the curtain, we would see the backstage crew that's always busy making sure the actors have the right props. We would see the actors themselves going back and forth behind the curtain to get ready for the next spot of entry. At the right moment of the play, sometimes we might see a heated debate that's happening entirely hidden from the audience. All of that backstage drama, though, is highly integrated and meant to be coordinated with the front stage drama. You can't have good front stage drama where the play goes off like it's supposed to without the coordination of the backstage. There's actually a play about that called The, one, the Play Where Everything Goes Wrong. Have you seen that? That's a funny play. It shows you what happens if the costumes don't get changed or if the actors don't know their lines or if the props fall over or aren't where they're supposed to be. It's a little bit like the Bible because how often, I don't know how many of you have read through the Bible in its entirety or attempted to and started in Genesis and did pretty good through Genesis, then you get to Leviticus and then the numbers and Deuteronomy, and you start wondering, why do I need to know all of this? Why is it important? Well, what the Bible do, is doing in a lot of places is to help us. It's giving us background information. It's showing us a glimpse of what's happening backstage. We live life in something like a front stage, where we see what's going on, the story unfolding around us, and we are wrapped up in that story, right? In the everyday life. It's so busy and it's so intense, and we have to pay attention to what's going on with that around us. And very rarely do we get to see what's going on backstage in the spiritual or the heavenly realms. It's like I told the kids, I don't know why we have bad days. It's not a question I can answer because I can't see what's happening backstage. But once in a while, the Bible will give us a glimpse into the backstage. What God's word will show us and help us pull back the curtain so we can see with eyes of faith what's really happening around us. One of the clearest places in the Bible that does that is the book of Job. Job has massive front stage drama, right? He knows he's going through great suffering in his life, but he doesn't know why. Remember, Job was always good. He was always righteous. He never cursed God. He always said thanks to God. He did all the sacrifices like he was supposed to. And yet tragedy just gets heaped upon him again and again and again, and he doesn't understand why. But as we read the book of Job, in the, we get a chance to pull back the curtain and see what's happening backstage in the heavenly and spiritual realms. Because the first part of Job, you open to the room, throne room of the Almighty God and see that Satan has made an entrance. And the great accuser is bringing an accusation saying, if you pushed Job hard enough, he would curse you. And God, hearing this accusation, knowing full well the faithfulness of Job, permits Satan to test Job to a certain degree and no further. And Job never does curse the Lord, no matter how bad it gets. 
But all of this happens without Job's knowledge. It's front stage drama, but he doesn't know about the backstage drama. We alone are given this privilege as we read the Bible. But still, we don't know what's happening in our lives. Very often, the front stage drama takes place without any realization of what's happening backstage. One of the most important places where we see this front stage, backstage coordination is whenever we gather for worship. Sermon preparation, practicing music, making sure the candles are filled, the flowers are changed for the season, the bulletins are printed, the PowerPoint put together, to name a few, are all things that need to be done in order for us to come together on Sunday morning and have a cohesive worship. All of us together are brought and playing out our part in our role in our worship of God. As pastor, I spend most of my time in the weeks preparing for that each Sunday. I steep myself in the scripture and I'm in prayer, wrestling with God about what the scriptures teach so that God can, be illuminate, can begin illuminating God's word to me. And one of the ways I do that is to ask God to expose sin in my heart so that I can repent for my sins so that I can then preach the gospel to you. There are many hands behind the scenes to make sure our Sunday worship is a spirit-filled occasion. Like I said, we're starting a stewardship series this Sunday, and um, I, I, we're starting it so late because I didn't want to break it up. I wanted to do four straight weeks, but we didn't have four straight weeks of Sundays where nothing else was going on. So I finally decided if I'm going to do it, I need to do it. And next Sunday is our children's service, and then the, in two weeks is, or three weeks is a healing service. So I thought actually breaking up, reading to you the exact same song four times might actually be a good thing. Because <laughs> repetition helps us learn, but it also makes us zone out, if we're being honest. Uh, so even though it's going to be broken up, we will be spending four weeks delving into this Psalm 50 to see what it has to teach us about worship. Specifically about tithing and offerings. About giving cheerfully of our time, our tithe, and our talents. Psalm 50 is one of the clearest passages that pulls back the curtain to the backstage drama that takes place every time we worship and give back to the Lord. If we're only looking at the front stage drama, what we are doing here, sometimes we can begin to think that we have gathered together to talk of, by ourselves of our own accord to talk about God, to speak amongst ourselves about God. Like God is some third person that's not in the room. But what Psalm 50 shows us is that God is present and God is talking to us. That we're not supposed to be having something like a memorial service where someone has been in our midst that we love and they've died and gathered to talk about this person like they only live in our memories. That is not what we should be doing when we're talking about God. Rather, when we gather in worship, we have not gathered to talk about God. God has gathered us to speak to us. God is the one who has summoned us together. God is the one who speaks by the Bible, and we speak back to God in this great dialogue of worship with prayers and hymns, affirmations, confessions, and offerings. What Psalm 50 particularly points us to is the reality that when God summons us into God's presence, God is accepting our acts of worship. Why do we answer God's summon with acts of worship? Simple. Because it is pleasing to God. Gather to me my faithful ones who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice, God calls in Psalm 50. Now sacrifice comes in many forms. And the first one we look at is time. Time is more sacred than ever. Doesn't it feel like we're busier than ever? And I've heard this be said, whether it is a retiree or whether somebody raising young children, it does not get easier. I thought when my kids got older, things would slow down. Instead, I think time is sped up. Between kids and parents and friends and work, we stay so busy, and then we're supposed to have time for self-care on top of that. Have you heard that? Self-care? We're supposed to take time for ourselves. 
We stay so busy. And even in the church, it might be good busy work. It might be busy work for God, volunteering and doing things that help, help further the kingdom of God. But it's still busy. So when we carve out an hour or two on Sundays for God, or on Wednesdays for Bible study, or to go to meetings even, we are sacrificing to God of our time, and that is pleasing to God. Now our tithes. Tithes are actually different than offerings. I think they've become interchangeable. But the offering is what we toss in the plate weekly. Tithes is looking at our monthly income, and before we plan out our bills and our pledge and our pleasure, we take and pledge 10% to God through the church. And what does the church do with that money? Well, some boring things like paying bills, but so, so much more. We have children's programs. We write letters and send cards to shut-ins. We send monies to our presbytery to reach out farther in our state. The Presbyterian Disaster Program, which is the national program, has boots on the ground, not just at the time of disaster, but for years afterward, rebuilding the same in the places all over the country and beyond. We just finished a few years ago going to Louisiana because of Hurricane Katrina. That was a long time ago, but we stayed there through the Presbyterian disaster relief to help and to help with the rebuilding process. The tithes that we give to the church do God's work in our community and in our world, and that is pleasing to God. And my favorite category are talents, because we have amazing talents in this church. Quilts and teaching, music and pie baking, cleaning, chili cooking, arts and crafts, so much more. This category, like I said, is my favorite because I get to see Jesus in the hands and feet of our congregation, which is something we were commanded to be, and that is pleasing to God. We make offerings to God because that is pleasing to God. We love God because God first loved us. We worship God in response to God's goodness to us. And that's what we should be remembering, and that's hopefully what we'll be learning as we go through Psalm 50 over the next few weeks. Amen. Will you stand as you're able and join me in the statement of faith? This world would deny you, Lord, and rely on human wisdom in their search for answers to questions they have yet to ask. But we will praise you and exalt your name, for we know that you are Alpha, the beginning of all things, and Omega, the end, and all that is between. We have known your healing, we have known your provision, we have known your victory. Our sorrow has turned into dancing, and our tears to songs of joy. We shall praise you evermore. Amen.
Joy is sort of deaf this morning. Yes, safe, but we want to make sure we are praying for everybody in Florida that's dealing with the hurricane, because even if they're safe physically, that doesn't mean that their property is, and there's a lot of people who've lost a lot of stuff. Um, any other joys? we got a brother-in-law that's collecting the stuff to take down to Tennessee and somewhere else. You can take it out to our place down here. There's places to got those big containers, storage containers, he's collecting it right now. Okay. Um, I asked my sister when he was leaving, she said, well, he's thinking Thursday. Anything specific that he well, wants? Well, there was a lot of camping stoves, and they were going to get propane bottles, just clothes, just, it was cups, pans, anything, just anything. Just anything. Okay, just in case you didn't hear that, uh, CNR Plating has storage containers that they are packing up with clothes, camping equipment, um, food, pots and pans, just anything that might be able to help um, the victims of the hurricane. So if you have things that you want to take to Goodwill, maybe take them down there. Thursday is when he's probably leaving, so to, uh, Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. That's wonderful. Tell him thank you for us for doing that. Anything else? How about concerns? Do we have concerns this morning? Yes. Prayers for Judy McCready. She fell and broke her arm. Yeah, she was going to that the little restaurant where they had mops and the floor was wet. Yeah. It's very good free food. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, that's right. Greg McHenry's stem cell stuff is supposed to start this week. He did get into the trial program. Thank you. They told me that on Wednesday. I forgot about that. Um, I have um, the little girl who's not a little girl. She's in her 20s now. But um, I took care of her. She has spina bifida. I took care of her when Alex was a baby. And she had to have uh, one of her legs amputated on Friday. But Friday evening, she was on Facebook posting and talking. I haven't called her yet. but. So she's doing well, and um, it was more the anxiety going into it. Uh, now she's doing pretty well. So keep, keep Mackenzie in your prayers, though, as she adjusts to the new, new way of life. Um, anything else? All right, then will you join me in attitude of prayer? Holy God, we come before you today in prayer and supplication with gratitude for our joys and lifting up of our concerns. We pray for all Christian brethren all around the world. We pray for our local presbytery and leadership who work to further your kingdom on earth. We ask that you strengthen your people for their witness and work in the world. We pray for the peoples of the world and their leaders, for countries in crisis, for our leaders of federal, state, and local government for police and those who administer our laws, and all who have responsibility, all men and women in their daily work. We ask that you give wisdom to those in authority in every land, and to give to all people a desire for righteousness and peace, with, with the will to work together in trust, to seek the common good, and to share 
serve justice, the resources of the earth. We pray for one another, our local community, those caring for people in need, those who teach. Enable us by your spirit to live in love for you and for one another. We pray for those in need, those who suffer, the sick, the poor, the distressed, the lonely, the unloved, the persecuted, the unemployed, those who grieve, and all those who care for them. We lift up to you today, especially the victims of the hurricanes, the devastation they faced, the loss of life, the loss of homes, is far more than we can imagine. We ask that you bless those that are giving to the hurricane relief, whether it be with money or items, that their work may go, no, that their work may go and bring your will to the world to show your love in every way. We lift up to you, Judy and Mackenzie, as they heal from their wounds. Comfort and heal, merciful Lord, all who are in sorrow, need, sickness, or any other trouble, and give them a firm trust in your goodness. Help those who minister to them and bring us all into the joy of their salvation. We give you thanks, Lord, for family. We give you thanks for blood family, for friend family, for church families. All of these that make us remember that we are not alone. We thank you for loving us. We ask that you accept our prayers through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is It Is Well With My Soul. In your brown handle or on the screen, number 321. <laughs>
will shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace this day and every day. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.